Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Dr. Julie Parker. Hi, you're so far away. Maybe you could come closer to us so we would feel your love and support as we talk about the complexities of gender and race and economic justice, because, you know, piece of cake. There's an empty table in front of me. There's an empty table to my right. There's a kind of cluttered but empty table to my left. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Great, great. Thank you. And I do want to apologize as one of the organizers of this event for the heat. Um, you know how it is working at a public institution. They put on the heat at X date, and then you suck it up, um, even when it's 60 degrees outside. So they, I did call. I did call. Um, but they said there's not a lot you can do, A, with the sun coming in the windows, and B, with the temperature outside kind of. <laughs> Only you would have to dare do that, Nick. Okay, so what we're going to do for um, this great session that I'm so excited about with these wonderful people, um, some of whom I have known, some of who I just met, is to give that a brief introduction um, to them because their bios are in this book, um, and you can read them. And then they're going to each talk for about five minutes, and I'm going to explain what they're going to talk about. And then we're going to really have kind of a conversation with some questions that we came up with in advance. Um, so it'll be a little less formal of a presentation than what you've seen already. And then we hope to engage with you about the topic. Does that sound good? Excellent. Great. Um, so did we have yeah. There's only this. Okay. Oh, great, great, great. Okay. Um, so, I'm really happy to introduce you to, to Lisa Lemieux, who I have known for a really long time now. Um, Lisa's one of those people that when she walked in the room today, I saw like all these people come up to her, like she was like this queen, you know, from, from union organizing. And um, she is, I know. Um, oh, that's our timer to start. And so I'm really excited to introduce her, also because Lisa and I sit on um, the South Coast Women's Alliance, which is an organization of women's groups that are, or groups that are really focused on um, the intersection of gender and race um, in the South Coast, and we're doing a lot of great work in that capacity. Um, she has many titles. Again, I will let you um, read all those, but I think her kind of most recent is that she's um, the president of the Southeastern Massachusetts Labor uh, Council, and she is now an organizer with the MTA, which is, I think of like our sister union, because I'm a member of the AFT of Massachusetts. Um, next to her is Kimmy Johnson, um, who I just met, um, but I was so excited because I'm a theater person, and so the work that she's doing with the motion picture industry is fascinating to me. Um, and so she is the first uh, female identified president of the International Association of Technical and- Just say <laughs> I had to see. Um, so we're really excited to have Kimmy here. And then um, Jill um, Ashton, I have known uh, for years involving my role as in the Bristol County Commission on the Status of Women, of which I was a co-founder when Jill was uh, working for the Mass Commission on the Status of Women and is now with the Women's Labor Bureau for the Department of Labor. So without further ado, they're each going to talk briefly um, about the way women, and particularly women of color, have a role in the work that their organizations are doing around economic justice. So, you know, I think part, part of what we talked about was the fact that we all got into this work in different ways. You know, I personally moved here from Texas, which was a right to work state, and didn't really know what the union, what the word union was when I moved here. And when I came here and went to work at AT&T in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, I very quickly learned what it was like to be in a union and what um, being in a union could do to change our working conditions um, when, when, when people came together, the power of people coming together. And I, un unlike Kimmy, had an amazing amount of mentors, some of which are in this room, who mentored me my entire life into the labor movement. When I came into this 33 years ago, there was not a lot of women in the labor movement, certainly not in leadership. And now I stand before you as the only female Latina president of the Greater Southeastern Massachusetts Labor Council. 
and, I, and I am super proud of that. And I've done amazing work in the unions. Most of my time has been spent with 1199 SEIU, where I had the privilege and the honor of working with healthcare workers um, across the Commonwealth, PCAs most specifically in the South Coast, um, who humbled me to no end. Um, and then most recently went to work with the Mass Teachers Association, which speaks to I think our issue here about how things have changed in the labor movement, where we talked about, you know, there were certain industries that were typically for women, right? Healthcare workers, educators, right? And now when we look at what we've done and what we've accomplished with building pathways, right? The idea that a plumber is no longer just a man, right? That your plumber, your electrician, your iron worker, your sheep, they can be women, they can be women of color, they can be, you know, anybody that wants to do the work, right? I'm proud to say that our building pathways, our building trades, right? They, they, you, you, you learn and earn at the same time, right? You can learn a trade while you're earning an income and being able to live. And I'm proud that the labor movement um, got that right. And I think that it's important that we acknowledge in this environment that unions did not always get it right. That very, for a very long time, unions were part of the problem, that unions were some of, uh, you know, they, they were not just racist, but Part, part of the start of the racism that held many of us down and many of the people before us down, and that we've started to have those hard conversations, many of which were driven by women. When you look at the history of our labor movement, there are not many battles that were fought and won that did not have a woman that helped start it, that helped fight it. We just weren't in the books, guys. But we were there. Right, and so that's, you know, to me it's important that we, that we raise each other up, right, because those of us who have the power of persuasion, and not all of us do, but those that do are the ones that we need to raise up, the ones that we need to elect to help change the things that need to be changed in our country. And so I think that, the, you know, the four of us sitting up here today is an example of where we've started that change um, and when I look across the room, I see lots of examples of where that change has started to happen. Um, and I know that not all unions have staff, nor do they all have staff unions, but where there are, we have to be strategic and intentional about um, negotiating contract language that allows us to hire people in the right way or you know, hiring language that allows us to think strategically about how we bring people up in the labor movement into these positions where we can help make a difference for everybody. How's, how's this? Uh, so I guess what makes sense is I'll tell a little bit about uh, where I come from and about our budding uh, film industry here because it's kind of a newer concept to everyone. Uh, so it ends up, I have a very defining feature at how I was adopted as an infant I look Asian, I was raised in a very white, upper middle class family. My sister was born in Bogota, Colombia. She's actually pasty white and looks like a Caucasian as well. So uh, and we grew up in a very white town. So just not even having a racial identity growing up was, was very difficult. Um, one comment that definitely always hits home is when my mom would uh, make comments, because there were other uh, adopted Colombians in town, my mom would go, oh, your sister would have had a hard time if she was dark skinned. She says that to her Asian daughter. She's like, oh, but you're a white minority. So that's just a little bit of um, something that's just, I always had an open perspective, never knowing where people came from, what their family was. Um, so my parents, they had to sacrifice everything to get us. Uh, then once they had us, they finally did go to college themselves and whatnot. So I guess me and my sister, yeah, they, put us, they, they let us go to college, do whatever we dreamed of. I ended up falling into the film industry, which I was like, oh cool, what, what's this? I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I had to work so hard. At first, um, so our um, IATSE Local 41 has been around for 34 years. Uh, at first it used to be a few little movies here and there, then we got a tax incentive in, in 2005, which made a huge difference. I got out of college in 2006. And when I came in, an entry level position is called a PA. And so when I came in before, all the people came in from out of town from LA, they came in and then flew immediately back. And so when I got my first job, 
All right, then they left and there was no one here to help me get the next one. I tried talking to my other coworkers and the, the field was predominantly male. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll help you out. They, they never did. So I had to fight for every single job. No one mentored me. No one helped me find the jobs. I had to fight for everything. And uh, I know that other people, they had a culture of saying, well, I had a tough time when I was a PA, so whatever, I'm going to treat them like crap too. I'm like, no, we absolutely need to treat people with respect when you want to be treated with respect. And then I especially took to heart mentoring anyone who was coming to the business, whether they were old or the, they were young, especially if they were female, especially if they were a minority, because there were just so few people that looked like me. And so then um, I was a self-made person. It took me years to get through from the entry level position to then decide, okay, I'm gonna join a union. I actually joined two locals of my, my union. And uh, some other people, they were just very fortunate. They fell into things, they knew someone or whatnot. But I tell people that, you know, it's some people's their struggles, it's a lot harder to find their pathway. And that I found out that my industry is one of the most highly unionized industries. And when I realized I could make such a good income and support myself and even give back to my parents and whatnot, I reflected on how my poor dad, he used to say, oh, I wish that my job was union. I didn't know what that meant. He worked for the town's water department and the fire department and did an ambulance shift and was an EMTI and taught CPR classes and constantly got his certifications. And he always worked three jobs. And so we didn't see him that much. And then my mom, she had a home daycare and she did that so she could be home to see us growing up. And so for me to see, wow, when you have a union job, you could work just one job and you could just work eight hours a day instead of all that like around the clock shifts and whatnot. And so uh, letting you know that now we have um, this really a thriving film industry here in Massachusetts. Thank goodness the, the actors are, are getting a contract uh, and we can start filming again. Um, but some things we've really noticed is, yeah, uh, trying to get more people with more diversity into our uh, union. So our international president definitely put forth uh, the emphasis on each local having a women's committee, having a diversity committee, having a pride committee. And within our local 41, we've been putting efforts towards that. And we actually the first uh, local uh, to have a full-time workforce development and outreach coordinator, and she's here today. And her focus is going to underrepresented communities, doing outreach and showing people that there is a pathway and an opportunity uh, to come into our industry and make a living where you can support yourself. So that's just a little bit of what I do, where I'm from. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone can hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, so I just wanna start by saying thank you to Julie for inviting me to be here today. Um, thank you to my co-panelists. I am just so in awe of both of them and deeply impressed, deeply honored that I get to sit next to them. I wanna say thank you to everyone else who spoke. I have so many ideas bubbling in my head. Uh, my goals for my remarks today are to share some information about the work that I do at the Women's Bureau, which is an agency within the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, I'm excited to be in conversation with you, so please, you know, we're, we're interested in the questions that you might have, and please feel free to challenge me or correct me. If I say something that's wrong, go ahead and correct me. I appreciate the opportunity to learn. Um, so the Women's Bureau, show of hands, how many people are familiar with it? Oh, this is a great opportunity for me. Yes, okay. So the Women's Bureau is an agency, a sub-agency within the U.S. Department of Labor. We are more than 100 years old, and I just deeply appreciate and value that history. So established by Act of Congress in 1920, um, when the agency was originally established, focused on the industries in which women were working, which were very few at the time, right? Cotton, um, cotton uh, factories and mill rooms. Um, at this time, we have um, uh, developed and expanded to be responsive to the, both the, the needs of the time, uh, the barriers that we see to equity, um, as well as opportunities. We have a tremendous opportunity in this moment to move equity, especially around moving women into um, fields that are non-traditional. So the structure of the agency is that we have a national office, um, and then there are six regional offices. I serve as the regional administrator for the Northeast region. Um, if you have colleagues um, or partners or friends, family, frenemies in other areas of the country that you think should know about the work of the Women's Bureau, um, it would be my pleasure to be able to put you in contact with colleagues that I have in other regions. Um, there are three key strategies which we employ to advance the goals of the Women's Bureau. The first is around research and, and policy analysis. The second is around grant making, where we use um, a small pool of money compared to some of the other grants in the federal government 
um, very strategically to invest uh, with community organizations that are supporting work that are aligned with our goals, and I can speak a little bit about those um, at a later time. And then the third um, uh, strategy that we employ to advance the work of the Women's Bureau is around um, educational programming and stakeholder engagement. So we're deeply interested in hearing about uh, the lived experiences of workers in our community, understanding what the needs are, um, making sure that we're bringing resources from the federal government to the communities as well as capturing information and then reporting that back to um, partners that we have in the national office. In this moment, we have three um, key themes under which we're organizing our work. And I'm excited to kind of think about how that connects to um, the experience that we'll share here today as well as some of the uh, information that's been shared earlier. The first is around moving women into non-traditional jobs. These jobs typically tend to be dominated by men and they typically tend to be higher paying. So we want to open up those doors for opportunities for women, in particular women of color. At the same time, we understand that there are women who are working in fields that are undercompensated and those fields tend to be, does anyone want to guess? Healthcare, childcare, right? Care, right? It's the care economy. And why is it that those fields are undercompensated? Is it because that work doesn't matter? Yep. Nope, it's because, <laughs> it's be, it's be because of who is doing that work, right? So we want to re, um, we want to re understand how we value care in our economy. The second theme of our work relates to, um, to pro providing access to care, right? So we know that the economy does not work if there is not care work. So how can we connect families, working families, to affordable quality child care as well as elder care? And there's going to be a huge need for that in, 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 the, in the near future. Um, as well as the opportunity to take time and care for yourself if need be. Um, and then we can only do that if we provide a strong care economy. So how do we compensate the folks that are providing that care? How do we ensure the resiliency of that Workforce, And then the third theme of our work relates to um, ending gender-based violence and discrimination in the world of work. We, un we understand that it's not enough to get women into these good, well-paying jobs if we can't keep them in these jobs, if they don't feel safe um, or if they're pushed out of these opportunities. I'll, I'll pause there so we can uh, begin our conversation, but I'm very excited to talk more about the work of the Women's Bureau. Okay, thank you all. Um, so I'm just gonna ask a couple questions and then I think we're gonna kind of spitball it with all of you so we can have a real dynamic conversation here. And I think the first question, because all of you have talked about non-traditional fields for women and the importance in them, is that I think about the ways in which we know that by their sophomore year of high school, girls have already decided whether they're gonna go into a science-based field, right? And I think that many people feel that some of these non-traditional fields do have that kind of science, right? like electricity is science, right? Um, <laughs> plumbing is science. Um, so how do you, how does the work that you're doing somehow intersect with the ways in which we're really trying to support what's happening to girls in that kind of K through 12 experience? Or maybe not. <laughs> So um, I can speak that uh, we've been having huge focus on outreach efforts. So those non-traditional uh, female roles that you'd find many males in, the vocational schools. And I've just been so proud of all the events we've been going to, those trade schools, and seeing the women who are hands-on and the people of color who are hands-on, and then showing them that you can have a respectable living and not have college debt. You don't have to do higher education, but you can if you want. But it's that you can have skill sets and enjoy what you do and do whatever field you feel like. And it's not that you have to conform to gender roles. And so in our industry, uh, we have um, people in the construction department, people in grip and electric, in these very more so technical roles that uh, we are increasing and encouraging women to, to be able to become a part of in my union. Um, I would say, you know, one of the Things that I learned very quickly going from representing healthcare workers to representing educators is that, you know, um, our kids' learning environment is our members' working environment mm -hmm. very quickly, right? And super proud of the fact that um, MTA was instrumental in helping to organize the last vocational school in Massachusetts that was not organized when we were able to organize um, Greater New Bedford Vote Tech 
um, which is instrumental, you know, keeping, you know, our vocational uh, classes going. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, what I like about, you know, when we look at some of our contracts that we have, you know, some of them are very new, some of them are very old, right? And some of them need a lot of updating um, in a lot of areas. And that's something that a lot of our unions have been working on um, and making sure, you know, building, building pathways, right? Like, a, you know, a career ladder is something that was always important to unions, but it seems like we've always focused on the money and we didn't always focus on the, on the pathway, the career pathway. And so when we do that, for our workers, right, it sets a great example uh, for the kids in our schools that are watching that pathway. So as we watch, you know, and then the other piece of it is making sure that we have, you know, educators, you know, in our classrooms that reflect the kids that are in those classrooms to help our kids believe that they can do that work or any work that they really believe or want to do. Can I build on your comment? So, um, but before I do that, there's two um, initiatives that I'll just lift up. Uh, Tools and Tiaras, a really fantastic organization that works with young girls um, to, to guide them into uh, construction uh, uh, opportunities, as well as Mass Girls and Trades. And actually, my colleague, um, Angela Rizzolo, would have been here with me today, but she's out in Springfield um, at this wonderful event because it is Apprenticeship Day, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, t just again, two. there are more, but those are the two that come immediately to mind. I just want to speak about an experience that I had recently. I was down in New York City and I visited a new uh, non-traditional employment for women. Um, and um, something you said about like, you know, show up for, um, you know, the uh, well-paying, you know, salary, right? But this woman said to me like, you know, I knew I needed to take care of myself. I knew I needed to take care of my family. I, I pursued this opportunity because I knew it was a good paying job. But now I see the opportunities for growth and development and support, and I'm excited about being a leader in my union. And I think that everyone who I speak to about that program in particular, but I fear I see this with other similar kinds of programs around mentorship and training, um, is that there are women who are brave enough to be the first or the few, and they are then very excited about supporting others to come into the field. And so lots of stories about um, you know, being invited in, and I think that that is the big takeaway for me, that we need to constantly think about being brave enough and then inviting other folks in. Thank you. Right. <laughs> okay. um, I love that you guys all answered that question so well. I'm very excited about it. Um, so another question I'd like to ask you all is that, so as someone um, as well as Lisa, who was the first person in a really long time to run my um, union. I ran our um, local 1895's educational services unit after um, a man did it for 20 plus years. Uh, and there was definitely uh, some uncomfortable folks in that. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the ways in which we could get more women of color um, and just women in leadership positions across labor and even just kind of in general, right? I'm thinking of like elections and we've been talking about voter rights and how do we get women front and center um, to be that person that, the, that young people see? Yeah, I think that some of this stuff is, is not new. These are problems that we've been talking about for a really long time. But it's about you know, dealing with issues like childcare and affordable housing, right? Like men, you know, and I know, you know, I commuted with, you know, when I was first representing people in Nantucket in the vineyard, right? It was my husband who was helping to stay home and take care of my kids and getting them to school and making sure that they were fed so that I could get on that first plane to get to the island to go represent the members that I represented and then got stuck on that island because we bargained all night long. And had I not had a husband who was home to take care of my kids and feed them, I would not have been able to do that. So, and on that train or on that plane that I was on was a bunch of construction workers who didn't have to think about who was taking care of their children because their wife was or their baby mama was or somebody else was, it wasn't them, right? And so if in fact, we are gonna expect women to do this work, right? We have to make sure, and, and it doesn't really matter. It's not even just, you know, it's not just construction and you know, laborers, right? If you're a doctor in a hospital and a surgeon and that surgery is scheduled for 6 a.m. in the morning, where is that surgeon gonna take their baby to before 6 a.m. in the morning? 
The difference is, is that they might make enough money to bring somebody else into their home, right? So we have to be able to close the gap where are you making enough money to pay somebody to come in and meet, you know, meet, help us eliminate these barriers? And if you're not making enough money to do that, how do we then overcome that barrier, help people so that they can actually do the work? Because some of these people who have those barriers might actually do the work better than those that don't, but don't do the work because they need help overcoming those barriers. So it's having those conversations and overcoming, you know, and it's those, you know, I, I think, you know, I, it's been a pet peeve of mine. I think we learned a lot from the pandemic. We really learned who the essential workers really were. Mm -hmm. And many of them were our own brothers and sisters who worked through the entire pandemic. And our federal government, in fact, did not take care of us during that federal government, during that shutdown, when we kept working, when our brothers and sisters kept working. And so it's on us to continue to organize, to continue to, to, you know, to change the laws and to make, uh, to organize more unions, to have better contract language in place so that we're prepared the next time that the next pandemic happens, and it will. It will happen again, and hopefully we'll be, we'll be better the next time around. We'll be more prepared the next time around. So I would like to speak on uh, experience with my union. I would hope that a lot of you guys are in unions and understand this sort of, um, to me, it feels like a family. Uh, what made a huge impact was our union had initiative to, to create young workers committees, so those who were 35 and under, and that was a really unintimidating un place to make a start. And then when I was sent off to a young workers conference, I was so inspired that we should be rebranded to young workers and new members because we welcome people of any age to join our union. So then the, the newer members have the same sort of issues as young workers because they're just new to our union. And I, I loved how it was a place for people to talk about where they were coming from, how they were trying to get to know their union. And then from there, many of our uh, elected uh, executive board uh, officers came from our Young Workers Committee and they wanted to be more involved, they wanted to be an elected official, they wanted to have the discussions and take actions that would make a difference in our union. And so then I, I just like the, the snowball effect of people first being a little bit intimidated, then being able to talk to people in a comfortable setting, then getting more involved and, and holding a role, and then encouraging and promoting, wow, I've got confidence in myself, all these different skill sets that I never could have imagined, and encouraging and inspire others to want to engage with their union, to want to understand what it is and what safeties we have and our protections, and to be proud of it, and then uh, making that cycle so you're increasing involvement, encouragement, and motivation. And then from this, there's just so many leaders that are now being born and they're now making a difference and we are welcoming of people from all colors, all genders and stuff. And so that is something that uh, starts small and then just increase involvement when you see people who are hungry for more. Yeah, I, I, I want um, to, yeah, I just so appreciate my co-panelists up here I, and, and, and the comments that they've shared, but you know, Kimmy and her personal experience, I really appreciate what Lisa said in terms of like the practical needs, right? Transportation, housing, childcare, those things are essential. Um, I think the thing that I could maybe add to it is, um, and from my perspective, right, you know, as we're thinking about how do we make a stronger, how do we achieve gender equity, right? We need to center women of color's voices in that work. Um, and I think when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, accessibility, belonging, it has to be something more than like, oh yeah, that's the right thing to do. We should check that box, right? Do we have to do that training once a year? Um, we really, really need to have an understanding of like why it matters, that those perspectives are not only essential, but they have been silenced for so long or forgotten or left out of the history books, um, have been, been made invisible, um, that we lose, that we, that we are all poorer for it. And that in order for us to be able to, you know, in order for us to, to, to be free together, we all have to have an equal appreciation of those diverse perspectives at the table. And so I'll, I will conclude by saying, it's something that we do at the Women's Bureau very intentionally. Think about how do we develop programs that are going to support women of color, those who have been, are most marginalized, those who have been most removed from opportunities, because we know that that will serve all of our workers and, and our communities. I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll get into a conversation with all of you. 
Um, so my final question for my panel, this is a big one. <laughs> um, so, so really, what do you think, particularly in the work that you're doing right now, are the most pressing, you know, hot button, needs to be dealt with as soon as possible, issues around advancing um, economic justice, particularly for women of color? Well, we all know we just um, we just had an election day, and we had some of the worst turnout numbers that we've ever seen in the South Coast, um, and in many and in many places, not just here. Um, you know, we have an opportunity to go into our next election season um, in a better way um, if we're willing to do the work. And this is like, you know, I feel like I say this almost every single day. I've been saying this every day for like the last 90 days. You know, there is no easy answer. You have to do the work. This is union organizing 101. Go back to the basics, knocking on doors, having face-to-face -face conversations with people. We have to elect union members. We have union members who are not even registered to vote. So that not only are they not voting, they are not registered to vote. We must take the time. We are no longer in a pandemic. We cannot use the pandemic as an excuse. We have to get out of our classrooms, out of our cubby holes, out of your offices. We have to talk to each other. We have to talk to each other about what the issues are, what we're gonna to do to fix them, and we have to elect our own union members. And it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a woman or a person of color, but it would be great if it is. But we have to start somewhere. We have to do a better job of getting people out to vote because the one thing that's clear, and you know, we don't, we don't need to give examples, I think our history shows it, is that when Democrats win, unions win, right? When unions were at their highest, at their peak, so is America, so is our economy. Right? Our members will do better. I say to people all the time, one of the most selfish things I did in this world was have children because I worry about what life my children, the quality of life are gonna have. And now I'm more worried about what quality of life my grandchildren are gonna have. What have we left for them? But it's not over. We, like There isn't a day that doesn't go by that there isn't something that we can do to help educate our union members. We just have to talk to each other. And I know, you know whether it's healthcare workers or educators in, in both worlds that I've lived in, that we're all busy. You know, I tell people, you know, I have four children and seven grandchildren. I was going, I was growing up in the labor movement doing this work. You have to be willing to make the sacrifice to make it better. And we don't have a choice, people. We have to do the work in order to make life better for our children and our grandchildren. And I know that we can do it. We just have to work together. And that means that we have to organize and do the work and that's what I, I you know I know I'm the president of the Labor Council and I'm biased but I believe in organizing regionally right the issues of the workers in Boston are not the same issues of workers in southeastern Massachusetts the issues of the workers here at UMass Dartmouth are not the same as the issues for the workers at UMass Boston we can say that for every single industry so we must organize region regionally whatever region you're from organize Talk to your neighbors, talk to your community members, and let's figure out what we need to do to have better results in 2024 for our unions and for our family and for our communities. So, um, it's pretty, pretty intimidating being with such powerful women and people who have quite the wealth of experience in their fields. And so I can keep talking from my perspectives and what's been going on in my union. That's what I can offer as a part of this panel. So I want to acknowledge that, um, so my, my union covers over a dozen different crafts that are mostly the, the crew who makes movies happen. And letting you know that there are some departments and some job roles that were traditionally filled by females. And the fact that they were historically filled by females, they, are, has, they, were, they still are currently the lowest paid jobs. And so before they first started as secretaries or glorified secretaries, and then they grew into coordinator type of work. And, uh, the, the respect, let alone the pay gap, has been a huge issue. And at least our international has acknowledged that that is something that's really important to rectify. So they are doing a pay equity study and through our contract negotiations. Uh, we are working on raising the floor of the lowest paid positions as opposed to trying to like uh, increase wages for everyone or whatnot. Well, 
don't just raise the ceiling, raise the floor so that everyone is treated equally with respect for whatever job they do. Doesn't matter if it's labor intensive, your intelligence and skill set, that is all very much valued in a skill set. And everyone should be able to have a respectable job and make decent wages, especially amongst your fellow siblings and peers, that everyone should be treated well. Yeah, I want to appreciate what Kimmy said in terms of their commitment to evaluating uh, compensation scales and making corrections where there are certain jobs that have been undercompensated. Um, I do also want to celebrate the unions. Um, we know that um, if you are a member of a union and you're a woman, you are 23%, are you're earning 23% 23 more than a woman who's not in a union. Or, for example, that would translate to um, it, the wage gap is 40% uh, less for you than if you are not in a union, which is significant. Um, I, I could talk all day about the wage gap, and, and, um, and I, I, will, I know that we're on our last question, so I'll get to my point. I think um, what I'd like to stress is, and, and kind of go back to something Lisa said, right? There are different needs in different areas, right? Geography matters, race matters, gender matters, um, your family's culture, all these, all these bits of your identity matter in terms of how you would define the most pressing issue. I think, and I hope this isn't a cop-out, I would say that from our perspective at the Women's Bureau, what we're seeking to achieve is that everyone has equal access to opportunity. They have equal access to education, um, they have fundamental needs that are met, um, as well as the opportunity for self-determination. And I think that if we're building in that direction, um, that is a, 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 a really constructive goal, and I know that we can do it together. So before I turn it over to the audience, I'm wondering if any of you want to ask each other anything. Oh, wow. <sighs> we weren't prompted on this question, so yeah. Does anyone have a, a, a first thought? No, I don't, I don't have any questions. I just want to make sure that I, you know, I think it's important that we celebrate our wins. And I know that um, 1199 SEIU just won a historical contract of winning a pathway to $25 an hour for personal care attendance, which is huge. I mean, that $25 an hour for you know people who are, you know, uh, taking care of people in their homes, right? We talked about the need, right? Um, and and you know when I think about the work that MTA is doing to raise uh, the floor for all um, educational support staff in their schools. Right, that is not an easy task, but we're doing it one school, one district at a time, um, and you know you think of all the the big strikes that we've had this year, whether it's MTA or you know the UAW or the Teamsters. We are in the most union friendly environment that we have been in in decades. And all I ask is that you be aware, that you be tapped in, and that you come out to the streets with us when we call for your help, because we're gonna need it. Because people are fighting for their lives to make things better. Um, so, you know, just be tapped in and, you know, come out and join us, but celebrate. We, I celebrate you and I thank the workers who are out there doing the hard work, setting the example and setting the tone for those, for those of us that need to be reminded that we need to do that work. Okay, all right, so um, I thought I had somebody to help me run around because I've been doing it all day, but it's all right. Oh, great, thank you so much. Great, any questions? <laughs> I have a two-part question. Um, trade schools um, has been historically they have uh, excluded all women, um, minorities. Um, how do we how do we um, press this issue and get people into um, the vocational schools, not just as a lottery? Right, because that's what the big thing is now. Is hey, you got to we're gonna have a lottery, which doesn't give you anything. It gives you like two people um, that look different. Um, how do we change that? How do we get more more um, more resources into these schools and actually um, do the things that we are trying to do? Hit again. I think we elect people who are, are going to help us improve the laws that we have, right? I say this all the time. We live in one of the most democratic states in the country, but yet we have a bunch of elected people who don't actually vote as Democrats, right, in our legislature, 
Like we have to change the landscape of our legislators in Massachusetts who are actually gonna work for workers because what we have now isn't working. Um, you know better than I do, Nick, right? You do this work every day. You know better than I do what we need to do um, to make it easier for kids to get into these schools. But I think at the end of the day, we know we need, we need better laws in place. We need better people elected to help us change those laws to make it easier on the ground level um, to, you know, the funding is there. This, you know, excuse about there's no funding, right? We all know that's not true. Our schools, our districts, our cities and towns, they have more money now than they've ever, ever had. And we are allowing people to get elected who are, ma who are making bad choices with our money for our communities, for our schools, for our hospitals, right? So we have to change the players that are getting elected. Um, I will, again, and just to the expertise on this panel is amazing over here, so I'll just add a small addition to that. I think um, that I would say, almost always, I think that the approach is gonna be multi-strategy, right, to like think about where are there opportunities, right? I, I agree, I think we should think more expansively about education and how we are creating opportunities for, for younger children to be um, learning in different ways, in different um, uh, uh, skills, trades, uh, you know, picking different paths for themselves. I think apprenticeship programs are important and uh, there is a lot more interest currently uh, by the Department of Labor in Massachusetts around promoting pr uh, apprenticeship programs. Um, and then the last thing that I wanna say is just a, a story, I tell you a story. I was speaking to someone yesterday in another state about, uh, and he's a, uh, an administrative official. We were kind of thinking about what are the challenges, what are the barriers, where can we work together? You know, and, and he was very straightforward and very sort of like all business. Um, and then I asked a question and just somehow his face lit up. I, I think it was like, you know, I, 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 it, it feels like I probably wouldn't have asked him like how he got there, but somehow he offered me this information about how he went to a vocational camp when he was a kid. And he was like, I just loved it. I loved it. And now he's working in administration, making space for other people in these roles. But he talked about how his best friend went with him and is working in a construction job. And so I think like where can we, again, kind of stack up these opportunities to earn and learn in an apprenticeship, to look for opportunities to push um, our elected officials at the local level around providing more educational um, diversity in terms of experience, and then also think about what are programs such as Tools for Your Tears or Mass Girls in Trades um, for, those, for those kids who um, would not have had an opportunity to explore uh, but for those programs. How can we expand those programs? And, and I'm thinking a little bit too about this question, Nick, in the sense of like, I went to a rural high school in Maine and vocational wasn't even op, like an option, right? So there was no one coming to my guidance group and saying, hey, you know, you could be a plumber or electrician or a, you know, a construction worker. Like that wasn't even an option, right? So I think that, you know, we need to do better again, you know, wherever people are to show young people that these are, op these are opportunities for them. And even like here in a college, like we don't need to assume that they're gonna leave here and go become a doctor or a lawyer. Like maybe they're gonna have an education but go into a trade and then become a manager and you know. So I think that we need to think bigger, right, about the ways in which we're teaching young Absolutely. people about that. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, one more question, and it's for Kimmy, and I'm a sorry uh, to, to think, um, because I'm a contract nerd, uh, how do you feel about the uh, tentative agreements, uh, both from the uh, SAG-AFTA and uh, the Writers Guild, um, what do you think about that? So the, the WGA and SAG-AFTRA are different guilds from our industry, but all of us work together to make movies happen. And so we knew that they had uh, quite the steep fight ahead of them, and if that they failed, that that's where we are like fighting against the AMPTP. And so they knew that they wouldn't settle for anything that wasn't gonna be acceptable enough, and so we supported them, and we knew that uh, when they were ready to ratify a contract, it was gonna be something that was uh, adequate and something to be proud of. And so we are very thankful for the struggle. We supported them during their strikes with their rallies and everything. And ourselves, we go to the negotiation tables next year. And so it is really important that uh, when different unions, they work together, we call them our sibling locals, that you make sure you support everyone uh, because they support you. And so you are stronger together. That's what the point of unions are. And so when we had the numbers, when we had the solid united front, that's what we all needed to get through it all. Over here. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, my name is William Kale. I'm uh, a PCA uh, from 1199. Um, I have five daughters. Um, 
Uh, they're all spread out throughout the state. Three of them are in Cape Cod. Um, one is up in, um, in Beverly, at North, North Shore. And I have another one in the Boston area. Um, two, uh, two of the daughters have white mothers. Uh, three of the daughters have Spanish mothers. Um, so all I have is females. I don't have any, any sons. What advice could you give me to help my, my daughters? And as well, um, I'm the only father for all these five daughters. So how, what advice could you give me to help uh, persuade the mothers to, to help the daughters as well? You know, so I, I am, a, and I'll, I'll stall so you guys can think of a brilliant response, okay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm one of two girls, um, and I, when I um, was pregnant with my first child, I was just, it just was like a fait accompli, like I was going to have a daughter, and then maybe I'd have another daughter, I don't know, maybe I'd have a third daughter. I was going to have daughters, folks. What did I have? Sons. Sons. I had sons. So I think that, you know... I, I just figured I was going to raise feminist boys. They were going to be the best feminist boys in the whole entire world. <laughs> and I've got a fantastically supportive um, husband and co-parent and partner. Um, and they are, you know, I was going off to this conversation today, and they were said, you know, look forward to seeing when you're, you know, in your home. But we're so excited that you're going to go. You, you go and do your work. I so appreciate that my partner has instilled in my boys uh, an appreciation for the work that I do and the work that I, I strive to do on behalf of other women. I think that what I would, my advice to you would, would be, be a really great feminist dad. Like, celebrate your daughters for their successes, the way that they, um, you know, what they are hoping to achieve, and continue to tell them that they're good enough and that they are, are, are capable enough and that you believe in them. So, um, so, one of my huge defining features, being adopted. Um, I love how my dad tells the story of when they asked, okay, so here, here's one child, so my sister's older than me. They, they adopted her two years later. They asked, okay, do you have a preference on the gender? My dad's like, oh, I have no preference, but I'm gonna have another daughter. Okay, so you want to go, no, it doesn't matter, but I'm gonna have another daughter. My dad wanted two little girls, and so the fact that we were adopted, you, you could choose gender. Uh, <laughs> and I just um, know that my parents sacrificed everything to get us. And I loved how that my mom, she actually came from the business world, and she said that in the 70s, she was working for Georgia Pacific and stuff. And so she instilled in us how she did not have pay equity, she could not have the title when she did all the work and the responsibility. And she told me that, you know what, you are gonna face things harder than, than guys do and whatnot, but just keep persevering because just prove yourself. If you work hard enough, anything you wanna do, do it. Only yourself is going to keep you down. And so then, to me, it's that when you have parents who have communication, you don't necessarily even have to give your kids advice. If you're there and they just want to talk to you, I, I, I know that I have the, the parents that I'm just like, they are the best in the entire world because they wanted us. And when I see other people where they don't really spend much quality time or they don't make time for their children, like, if you're just there, that makes them grow into a person who then cares about other people instead of just thinking that there's no one there, they're not gonna make a difference, they're just a single person living alone in the world. To me, like community and families, that's, that's the world. That shapes people into being a better person, becoming a leader, people who want to help uplift others who didn't have a good upbringing. Or even if you had a crappy upbringing, then go against that and promote other people having a better life and en enriching their lives. So the strength of women, that there's a lot of barriers we face, but uh, we all need to come, overcome whatever we're faced and uh, it's only yourself who's going to keep you down, so just make yourself move forward and, and uplift others as you move along your journey. And I would just add, um, to wrap it up, I think, you know, unfortunately, you, you, I would think you maybe can't persuade the mothers of your children to do anything, um, that they're going to have their own power to do what they want to do. But I think that, you know, as someone, I'm also adopted, and I had uh, an adopted father who just always, you know, I think, again, lifted me up and talked about how I could do anything. So I think I went into the world assuming that I could do anything, and then when you're, you know, hit with sexism for the first time, you're kind of like, what the hell was that? 
you know. So I think it's just kind of reminding them that when they run into those obstacles, you know, that they can persevere, that they can push through, that there are things that can protect them. There theoretically is a law that can protect them, um, you know, so that they're at least aware, you know, that when they hit those obstacles that they can, they can persevere and keep going. And I think we have to also get away from just, like, calling little girls cute and pretty and all that shit. I'm so sick of it. Like, you know, you see, I see, my niece just announced that she's having a baby girl, and everybody in the family is saying, we can't wait for the little princess. And I said, you guys can't wait for a princess, but I can't wait for a warrior. <laughs> Um, hi, good afternoon. Uh, Lisa Nauer, a teacher at UMass Dartmouth, um, and I'm also very involved with the immigrant worker community, as Lisa Lemieux and I know, because we sit on a bunch of boards and committees together. So I wanted to kind of raise a question about another set of intersections, which is gender, race, and immigration status, mm -hmm. right? Because we know that this region um, in addition to work being gendered and raced, <laughs> the kinds of work that people do or are eligible for has much to do with their legal status or lack thereof, their authorization or lack thereof. I know um, DOL, at least on the national level, has been very involved in this new program called Deferred Action, which allows people to apply for work authorization. But the way I get that these intersections make it even more challenging for both immigrant women and men, and again, you know, gender obviously is not just, we're not just talking about women, we're talking about gender and how it affects everybody who is a gendered and raced body um, in the workforce. But we know that a lot of the work done in this area, probably most of the food that you ate today for lunch and most of the clothing that everyone has on their backs today was, <laughs> The food certainly um, processed and picked and cultivated by immigrant workers, black and brown people, both men and women. And the clothing, whether it was stitched in the United States or elsewhere, probably passed through the hands of women workers. And we know that historically this region, okay. I'm not gonna give the entire lecture, but just to think about, so how do we address the issues that are faced in this kind of you know, triple bind that many immigrant workers find themselves in, and many of whom are in, some of whom were in workplaces that are unionized, some of them work in jobs, and thinking of my companion here, Andre, who is from the Brazilian Workers Center, you know, which a lot of domestic workers, nail salons, I mean, there are many, many kind of categories of work that we know that immigrant women um, are very often in. So just um, some thoughts about that. I know none of you, I don't expect any of you to have the solution you know, to this, um, but just your thoughts about what are kind of challenges and then also what are things that we at the university can do? Mm. Because that's where we are and, you know, in addition to our students, we also have workers here. So, a lot of questions. So, I mean, I'm super proud that um, the national AFL-CIO gave us this charge, you know, several years ago um, about the need for us to partner and collaborate um, and since I've been, you know, involved in the local labor movement, you know, here locally, we've had organizations like the CEDC and the Coalition for Social Justice and, you know, the NAACP and Mass Senior Action. Like, we've always partnered, but it was only in the last decade that it became a mandate from the national AFL-CIO. And so we're actually doing a better job of that, right? And, it, and as you said, Lisa, we haven't fixed all the problems, but we're talking to each other and collaborating and coordinating better now today than we ever have. But no different than any other industry that or any other union has, it's hard. Massachusetts is a very, you know, you know, it's it's weird coming from Texas that I would say that Massachusetts is large, but when you're trying to do the work day to day, I have colleagues that I work in the same office with, and we don't see each other because even in the South Coast, we don't, our paths don't cross because our work keeps us separated. And that's true for, right, the Brazilian, right, workers, right, like all of our organizations, as much as we want to work, we all have meetings on the same night, right? So even though we invite you to come to the Labor Council, you can't come to tell us what's going on in your organization because you're having your own meetings. And so it gets back to the situation, you know, 
right? Unions, we've always said, right, we don't just represent unionized workers, we represent all workers. That's not gonna change. We're gonna continue to do that. We're gonna stand with you, by you, for you, right? No matter what, we just need workers to come to us, right? I say this all the time, right? Immigrant, legal, not legal, I don't care where you are. If you are a worker and we can help you, all you have to do is come to us, we will come. We, there is no more, there is no labor council that has more solidarity than this one here. Our people will come, all we have to do is ask. So if there is a problem, like call the labor council, call Lisa Lemieux, my number's all over Facebook, right? We will come, it may not be me personally, but we will get bodies there and that's what makes the difference. And so we just have to continue to work together, talk about the problems that are happening. You know, when I find out that there is an owner of a business in the city of New Bedford that's holding a gun to workers to get their money, like we should go to the streets. You should be pissed off about that. That shouldn't happen anywhere. But we don't, I bet you that 90% of the people in this room didn't even know that that was happening. Right? And if it's happening in New Bedford, you bet it's happening somewhere else. And there isn't an elected official that would say that th that's okay to happen. But we have to tell the story and we have to raise it up in order to fix the problem. And so, you know, I know that uh, the board members that I have here in the room that represent our labor council are committed to helping all workers in the South Coast just, you know, give us a call. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yes, 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 right. Um, I, I think, it, yeah, it's, it's like the union's role here is so important and I just, again, want to celebrate that. I think um, I, I said earlier that the Women's Bureau facilitates two grants. Um, the first grant is one to women in non-traditional occupations, excuse me, women in apprenticeship and non-traditional occupations. Um, the second is the FAIR grant, Fostering Access, Rights, and Equalities. Um, and this is a very uh, intentional investment that we make. We will work with community-based organizations because we know that government is not always a trusted resource. And so by um, taking, you know, taking dollars uh, and, then, and then delivering them to Two community-based organizations that can do um, voter education, making sure that uh, excuse me, worker education, um, that they are aware of their rights and they're able to exercise their rights is, is again a very intentional choice that is made by the Women's Bureau. I think that, as I said earlier, sort of what is necessary is this multi-strategy approach. Right, we've got government who is insisting upon um, uh, uh, workplace safety. Uh, worker workplaces that are, are respectful uh, and are free of violence as well as you have the protections of the unions I think the other thing that we can do is um, you know uh, communicate to individual workers um, their rights it's going to be hard it is going to be hard I am not saying that um, this is easy and I am not saying that um, we do not have a, uh, a steep hill in front of us but it is work that needs to be done Okay, we have like five minutes left. If there's maybe one question or not. Seeing none, uh, I wanna thank you all for coming to the best of the two panels that are happening right now. <laughs> um, and I just feel so honored and privileged that I got to sit at this table with these three amazing people who are doing such great work out in the world. And so thank you so much, Jill. Thank you for so much, Kimmy. Thank you so much, Lisa. Look forward to hearing from Lisa tonight. We'll be emceeing the banquet if you're sticking around. Um, so again, I appreciate your time and your energy. And thank you so much for coming to this panel. <laughs>